my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I've committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, arsons, and last but not least, I've committed sodomy on more than 1,000 male human beings. For all of these things, I am not the least bit sorry. I have no conscience, so that does not worry me. I don't believe in man, god, nor devil. I hate the whole damn human race, including myself. I am Carl Panzram. I'm Robert Gray. I'm head of Special Collections and University Archives here in the library at San Diego State University. And what you see here are uh, three uh, examples uh, from the diary of Carl Panzram. Panzram was arrested for a housebreaking charge, relatively minor. And when the police brought him in, he said, this is a very small charge. I've committed numerous murders over the years. This is nothing. Authorities had no idea that he was arrested in Oregon, that he was arrested in Montana and these other jurisdictions out west, because he always used a different name. Upon his arrest, he begins to talk about a couple of murders that he committed. This is the very first time that, that we can confirm that he ever even talks about his prior crimes. The story makes its way into the newspapers and the story begins to, to gather momentum about this prisoner that is being held in a Washington DC jail who's confessing to lots of murders. Inside the Washington DC jail at that time was a very young, 25 years old jail guard by the name of Henry Lesser. Lesser was a new guard and somewhat idealistic, very unlike the, uh, the stereotypical prison god of his day. I found out he was alive and he'd been Panzram's guard. That's all I knew. Today we're going to be interviewing a very unique individual, Mr. Henry Lesser, who was the guard to Carl Panzram, the most renowned murderer in his time. He was a uh, husky man. Uh, he walked with a limp. After I was in jail a short time, I uh, happened to hear that there was a, uh, a prisoner in the south wing where I was working that time who seemed to be a very interesting person. And uh, the first opportunity, I went uh, past the cell and uh, got talking to him. Lesser befriends uh, Panzram while Panzram is in his cell. He gives him cigarettes and, and treats him uh, nicely. And Panzram takes a liking to the young guard. 
and they begin to have a friendly relationship. I asked him what was his racket, and he said, How do you know? How to be diplomatic. I said, I just, just had an idea. I'm being held for investigation. I reform people. I kill them, put them out of their misery. This was something that was contrary to the, to the rules of the profession, but which, of course, was totally consistent with the rules of humanity. Colonel Peake was a superintendent of the Washington, D.C. jail when Henry Lesser was employed as an officer there. Colonel Peake had all of us into his office going on that shift, afternoon shift. Uh, he told us that we, he was informed that we had a, a very dangerous man in our midst and to be extra careful. The guards come into the cell just to take a look because they know of his previous escape attempts and they find that uh, some of the bars were loose. Panzer M is then taken out of that cell. He's brought into the basement of the institution. Colonel Peake ordered him to the post down in the basement of the jail. It supported beams in the ceiling. He was tortured at the post, his, his back up to the post. He was manacled, his hands manacled on the back. He was forced off his feet some distance. He was kept there all night. The first night, he didn't know where he was going, so he didn't put up a fight. But the second night, he knew, and he fought. subdued him with uh, clubs and he was kicked and dragged down to the uh, post again. The DC jail where Panzerum was tortured was a jail where slaves had been tortured a hundred years earlier. It was something that had to be conducted in the most subterranean part of the institution and something that people were really ashamed of. Uh, next morning, after the second night, I uh, came to work and uh, I was told I was uh, by uh, the head tiersman, the prisoner, who had charge of selling the men as they came in. I was told about the, uh, the torture of Pan's Ram and uh, I almost hit the ceiling. I was greatly distressed about it. I felt he was a uh, man in the clutches of the law and they had no right to do what they did to him, even though he. He was a murderer and so on. And I told the tearman, tearsman, to uh, take a dollar into him uh, because uh, I knew he had no money and uh, they always had a canteen where you could buy uh, smokes, uh, sweet stuff and so on. So uh, this man went past the cell, went to his cell and said, uh, Carl, uh, there's a guard here, Henry Lesser, sent in a uh, dollar to you. Once Panzram develops a sense of trust with Lesser, Panzram begins to open up to Lesser. Thanks for the buck. And begins to tell him the story of his, his miserable life. And then I felt he had a story to tell. I had an idea that he had something to tell us. And I encouraged him to write his autobiography. And he demurred. He said, Jesus Christ, I can't do that. I went to school, got out of sixth grade. I've never written. I said, you, you started, started. And I encouraged him. It took a couple of weeks until he finally started writing. 
he smuggles in uh, paper and pencil because prisoners are not allowed to have these, these objects, but Lessa provides them with the, the, the writing materials. True statement of some of my actions, including the times and places and my reasons for so doing these things. Written by me of my own free will at the District Jail, Washington, D.C., November 4th, 1928. If after reading what I write, your faith in human nature isn't all destroyed, then it never will be. We had an arrangement. By the time I was on the midnight shift, 12 to 8, so we arranged that when he gets through writing 10, 15, 20 pages, he should leave it on the bar of his cell. And I started reading this, you know, and it wasn't more than a week, 10 days, but I felt I had something worthwhile. It was an honest attempt on Pans Ram's part to tell a story. Society should know his part of it. I want society to know my side of the story. Even if only one man reads it, suits me. Lesser was probably thinking that uh, it may be an example uh, for people to understand what makes somebody like Pans Ram. Eventually, Pans Ram wrote about 40,000 words. I was born a normal human being. I was born on a small farm in Minnesota. My parents were of German descent, hardworking, ignorant, and poor. The rest of the family consisted of five brothers and one sister. My father and mother split up when I was about seven or eight years old. The old man pulled out one day and disappeared. This left my mother with a family of six and a small, worked-out farm. He already had that kind of temperament where he was resentful and reactive, so he's probably going to go up against his mother's authority and he doesn't like it. He got attention, but it was negative attention. And, and that's the sad part of this thing because uh, uh, infants born healthy uh, that are nurtured will not grow up to hurt other people fact. He had five brothers, I think, and a sister. None of them came forward to say, yeah, this was a really bad situation. We were all abused. And in fact, they seemed to have grown up and become okay. When I was a boy, six or seven years old, I always had trouble with my ears, always aching and running with matter. My people were too poor to have me in a hospital, so I was operated on in our own home on the kitchen table. This was a mastoid operation behind my left ear. It could certainly have affected him if you had any kind of brain damage or uh, unbalanced brain chemistry or something like that. It could explain free-floating anger. You just don't feel right. Something's, something's wrong. You react to it. You, you put labels on it and find causes for it, but you don't really know what it is. It's just a, a complete sense of things not being right. He broke into a neighbor's house. And stole everything that to my eyes had the most value. Those things were some apples, some cake, and a great big pistol. This is a resentful kid who looks at what other people have and wants it for himself, so he decides to take it. That's not necessarily a product of abuse. That's just his own personality. I walked to the railroad yards where I caught a freight train going to the west, where I intended to be a cowboy and shoot Indians. It wasn't that long before his birth, 40 years before, that there had been uh, tremendous massacres of Indians by settlers and settlers by Indians. Genocidal Indian wars had gone on and there was tremendous racism toward Indians. This may have contributed to his talk about going out and uh, playing cowboys and Indians and shooting Indians because many uh, young people at that time were really trained, conditioned to think in terms of killing Indians. It's more than 20 years ago. 
but I've been a cowboy since. I was caught, brought back home, and beaten half to death, then sent to jail. And from there, the Minnesota State Training School at Red Wing, Minnesota. Right there and then, I began to learn about man's inhumanity to man. We're looking at um, punishment slips, some other records, a statistical record book regarding Charles Panzram, who was an inmate, 12 years old at the time, of the Minnesota State Training School. According to the record book, his relations with his parents was quarrelsome. His environment's defined as bad, and then the character of his associates, that's described as bad as well. Trying to determine what's fact or fiction with him is very difficult. Uh, but he did say that he had a mastoid infection behind his left ear, and he had an operation. And when you look at uh, the record book, there's a line for special marks and scars. There is a notation that says he has a scar behind the left ear. We were all supposed to go to school a half a day and work a half a day. These were institutions that had been devised in capitalist society to train people for the industrial system, to train them to become good industrial workers, to be obedient, to be silent, to perform the tasks that were needed uh, by industry. And there also was a great deal of regimentation. And the rest of the time, learn how to love Jesus and be good boys. Yeah, like they said that Jesus was the son of God, you know, and maybe Panzram was the son of the devil. At the frame of the painting that I did of Panzram, I have Red Wing on the top left side. I chose Red Wing because that was his formal education into what it was like to live among human beings. The beginnings of it was at Red Wing. They had a system in the institution, uh, a demerit and a credit system, where if Panzeram would act up or misbehave, he was given a demerit slip. There are 27 punishment slips for Charles Panzeram which are from his case file. They're for such things as stealing food, talking back to the teachers, being disorderly, whispering, calling a boy a snitch, putting sugar in his pocket, talking loud. He is impudent all the time, doing very poor work, disobedient, breaking two dishes, using bad language. He has that sense of callous disregard. Kicking another boy. Probably hyperactivity. Throwing a piece of crayon at another boy. A bit of ADD. Throwing food. He doesn't have a sense of focus and a sense of life direction. He just does what he wants for himself. Stealing butter. Acts that wouldn't really be considered serious if he was outside the institution. Playing in school. Just the acts of a child. He wasn't motivated to earn those credits so he could get out of there. He will constantly be hitting his head against a brick wall, and all they'll do is put further restriction on him, put him in isolation, punish him. They started me off by trying to beat the Christian religion into me. The consequences were that the more they beat and whipped me, the more I hated them and their damn religion. Aren't we the same country that praises the Judeo-Christian ethos, the ethic, you know, that we are Christians and we want to help people. We want to work with people. Well, we're sure not showing it. They had various methods of punishing us for doing wrong and for teaching us to do right. The most popular with them was to take us to the paint shop, so-called because there they used to paint our bodies black and blue. And this also intensified his feelings of, of abandonment and, uh, and victimization. The first time he finds himself in an institution and he begins to get his footing and see the others around him, he's going to realize that he's got to create a persona. I began to hate those who abused me, 
Then I began to think that I would have my revenge just as soon and as often as I could injure someone else. He wants to one-up other people because that's his personality. He also likes attention. Anyone at all would do. If I couldn't injure those who injured me, then I would injure someone else. I think this is where he begins to create this idea that he's, he's the worst of the worst. He's nobody better mess with him. The best predictor of future behavior is what's happened in the past. Carl Panzram attempted a number of escapes when he was very young. One of the punishment slips dated March 16, 1904. He had attempted to escape from the school. I was too dumb to learn anything in school, so they took me out and put me to work all day washing dishes and waiting on tables in the officer's dining room. Once each week, I used to be sent to the laundry to get the clean linen for the dining room. One cold winter day, I went there and didn't come back. I attempted to escape. But got caught, brought back, damn near beaten to death. After fully investigating the above report, I would recommend that he has a spanking. I can only imagine what their spankings were like. Unfortunately, the spanking was just uh, an early indicator of the type of punishment or torture that he would um, have inflicted on him in other prisons later in his life. I began to try to figure out some other way to punish those who punished me. The only thing I could figure out to do was to burn down the building in which the paint shop was located. This I did. We can see evidence of kids who may grow into psychopaths very early, as young as, as three years old. And those kids will have a tendency to blame, they'll lie, they'll steal, they'll be cruel to animals and other kids. After serving about two years there, I was pronounced by the parole board to be a nice, clean boy of good morals. I had been taught by the Christians how to be a hypocrite, and I had learned more about stealing, lying, hating, burning, and killing. From the treatment I received while there and the lessons I learned from it, I had fully decided when I left there just how I would live my life. That night, I resumed my journey to the West that had been cut short two years before. I was about 13 or 14 years old at the time. I started out a hobo and soon learned how to ride freight trains and passenger trains inside and out without paying my fare. One experience that I had during that time I never forgot and it had a direct bearing on a lot of actions later in life. He claims that he was assaulted, uh, gang raped, by uh, four other individuals who, who were on that train just as soon as we all got into the car and shut the door and the train pulled out, they all began to tell me what a nice boy I was. First, they wanted me to do a little something for them. I told them no. What they couldn't get by moral persuasion, they proceeded to get by force. I left that boxcar a sadder and sicker but wiser boy than I was when I entered it. After that, I always went alone wherever and whenever possible. I learned to look with suspicion and hatred on everybody. Force and might make right. Perhaps things shouldn't be that way, but that's the way they are. Those were the days when I was learning the lessons that life teaches us all, and they made me what I am today. He turned it around, got angry, and decided this is what I'm going to do to others. Another lesson I learned at that time was there were a lot of very nice things in this world. Among them were whiskey and sodomy. When he did leave home and found out pretty quickly by riding the rails that he was a vulnerable person, he, he saw the way to dominate others was through rape or, or beating someone up. And so he set himself to do that. And those are the people who were available. 
men and boys. It wasn't women or girls riding the rails, it was men and boys. So clearly his early patterns of dominance were set right there. Whenever I met one who wasn't too rusty looking, I would make him raise his hands and drop his pants. I rode him old and young, tall and short, white and black. It made no difference to me at all except that they were human beings. I knew more about sodomy than old boy Oscar Wilde ever thought of knowing. Because he was abused himself in that way uh, at Red Wing, on the trains and, and in other instances, he may have seen this as a way, a twisted way of getting revenge on the people that did it to him. I was so busy committing sodomy that I didn't have any time left to serve Jesus as I had been taught to do in those reform schools. You're raping your own equal, so you're showing that you're the one who's in power. It, it has nothing to do with getting a sexual pleasure. Even if you do get that, that's not the point. The motive is to dominate others and make sure everyone knows you're the guy, you're the boss. While he's in the city of Helena, Montana, uh, he's, he's 16 years old at that time, and he's in a bar, and a army recruiter uh, comes in and gives a speech about joining the army. I joined the U.S. Army in 1906 at Helena, Montana, stationed at Fort Harrison in the 6th Regular U.S. Infantry and A Company. He lies about his age and joins the army. <laughs> He was trained in the military ways as a, as a young man and then went into the, the army, which was another form of prison. The regimentation of army life does not fit in with Panzram's personality. He steals some property from the supply house. I was only in the Army a month or two when I got three years in the U.S. military prison at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. My number was 1874 and my name was Carl Panzram. One of my tasks and punishments while there was to be shackled to a 50-pound iron ball for six months. My part was to load my iron ball, an 18-pound hammer, a pick and shovel, and a six-foot iron crowbar all into a wheelbarrow and march behind the line of cons three miles out to the rock quarry and there work for eight and a half hours in the hot Kansas sun busting big rocks. But all that treatment did one good thing for me. The harder they worked me, the stronger I got. I was discharged from that prison in 1910. I was the spirit of meanness personified. What recourse he had was to get out of Leavenworth. He was a young man and reform. In theory, yes, it is that easy, in theory. He had already created a certain persona of this bad guy. 70% fail within three years. And now he's going to go act that out. He is a product of his, of his psyche and his environment. I had not at this time got so that I hated myself. I only hated everybody else. What you see here is the first page of, uh, of the diary where Panzeram goes through all the prisons that he had been incarcerated in throughout his lifetime. I've been in two reform schools, seven big prisons, and hundreds of jails. None of them were any different from the others. Jesse James and Dillinger had a certain amount of bravado and Babyface Nelson did, but none of them compare to the bravado of Panzram. They were asking him what his profession was, and he would say thief. <laughs> I could have been taught properly, 
and if I had been, I feel sure that I would have led a far different life than I have done. Some of the blame is yours for not making it your business to see to it that such conditions should not exist among your fellow man. Torquemada, the chief inquisitor of the Spanish Inquisition, was known as the world's greatest torturer. The rack. The wheel. The red hot irons to burn out the eyes. Pinchers to pull off parts of the body, fire to burn, and water to drown. But they were very crude compared to those in use today. During my 20 years in all the various prisons and jails I've been in, I've undergone every kind of abuse and punishment that the ingenious minds of many men could devise. In the United States, we are not aware that we have such a very long and rich and dark history of imprisonment. There was beating. There was torture that was administered in the American prison system for generations. These are all things that are not reflected at all in the textbooks in the sanitized version of history of American prisons that we're all accustomed to. We like to forget the bad history, but we are a product of our history, as was Panzerim. They kicked the hell out of me, put me in the cooler. Cold, dark, that was completely isolated in a prison within a prison within a prison. Confined to that kind of space, one gradually lost Touch, touch with, with reality. Pandrum was subjected to this for long periods of time in many of the prisons. The more cooler you get, the more heat and hate there is generated in your heart. He's going to be the one who will attract the tougher, meaner guards who themselves are trying to prove something. He was constantly refusing to give in to the primary thing that the prison system was trying to do to him, which was to break his will. He maintained his will. He tried to maintain his dignity, twisted as it was, as he saw it. They stripped naked and chained us up to the door, and then turned the fire hose on us until we were black and blue deaf and half blind. Many a man has paid for what those men done to me that Sunday morning. Panzerim is tortured by the guards who used uh, several different methods uh, to control the population. One is the snorting pole. <laughs> when the lash begins to take away little bits of hide and the blood begins to run and the sucker begins to jerk and yelp jump and snort. That's why it's called the snorting pole. <laughs> if you ever get it, you'll snort the same as I did when I got it. <laughs> when a man is let down after being well whipped, he has blood on his back and murder in his heart. He's somebody who was very much produced by the prison system. And they are, after all, only convicts. They're only criminals, so what the hell? That attitude is, is what's sad. Back in the early 20th century, wardens were the kings of their own autonomous kingdom. They could do mostly whatever they wanted, and the inner workings of the institutions were not exposed to outside supervision. One of the things that he and others endured was something called the hummingbird. A device that would inflict the maximum of corporal punishment with the minimum of harm to himself and the most exquisite anguish on the victim. He was put in a steel bathtub. In his hands, he holds a common sponge. This sponge is connected to an electric battery by wires. He was wet down, given electric shock. The sensation of the victim are that there seems to be millions of red-hot needles sticking into him. is intense. This was something that started in the 1870s in Ohio. As soon as the, the battery was invented, there was somebody to use that battery to deliver this kind of demonic treatment to convicts. 
two or three minutes of this, and the victim is then all ready for either the grave or madhouse. You can appreciate through empathy why the guy was so angry, so outraged, because these are the people that you're, that you're trusting to look after you, to guide you, to, you know, to punish you, but constructively, not destructively. To some extent, he's a logical product of a prison system, of a brutal prison system. But on the other hand, it's not the only possible product of the prison system. So while it's logical, it's not necessarily causal. If you think that you can stop crime by catching us, locking us up, punishing us by brutal treatment, hanging or electrocuting us, sterilizing or castrating us, then you are a fool for thinking that way. That only makes bad matters worse. fall until my gun was empty of bullets, and I was empty of courage. Panzram was successful in escaping again from Oregon State Prison. Panzram stole a white prisoner's uniform, spread the bars, and walked right out of that prison. I made a break from the inside of the walls. I still owe 14 years there. His ability to escape from prison was very remarkable. I've never seen anything like it. He, he was <laughs> kind of the Houdini of outlaws. The one time he broke into a prison to help a fellow convict break out. He was caught, but he did manage to get inside the prison. For all the misery and tortures that I have went through, I have made other men go through many times over. Only worse, after escaping from the state prison at Salem, Oregon in May 1918, I changed my name to John O'Leary took out Siemens papers, passengers' passports, and went to South America, Europe, and Africa. For the next five years, I was in 31 different countries. I went up to New Haven, Connecticut. I robbed the home of someone in that place. I got about $40,000 worth of jewelry and Liberty bonds. The bonds were signed and registered with the name of W.H. Taft. William Taft, of course, uh, was the former president of the United States who, after he left office, became a law professor at Yale University, and that's why he was living in, in New Haven, Connecticut. With that money, I bought a yacht, the Akista. After he purchases the boat, he lives on this boat in Long Island Sound for several months. Then I figured it would be a good plan to hire a few sailors to work for me, get them out to my yacht, get them drunk, commit sodomy on them, rob them, and then kill them. My motto is, rob them all, rape them all, and kill them all. <laughs> they are there yet. Ten of them. You are to blame more so than I. If you are going to go on teaching others as you have taught me, then you must suffer the same as I. Panzer is clearly a psychopath. Psychopaths tend to blame and not take responsibility for anything. He gets on a ship as a seaman and he sets sail for Africa. He gets a job with uh, the Sinclair Oil Company. He comes across a small boy. He sexually assaults the boy and murders him. His brains were coming out of his ears when I left. He will never be any debtor. I went to town, bought a ticket on the Belgian steamer to Libido Bay down the coast. There, I hired a canoe. Pandrian pulls out a gun and shoots all six men. I threw them overboard and the crocodile soon finished what I had left of them. This lesson I was taught by others. Might makes right. At Salem, Massachusetts, I murdered an 11 or 12 year old boy by beating his brains out with a rock. I left him laying there with his brains coming out of his ears. I met a fellow who said he wanted to buy my boat. He tried to stick me up, but I shot him twice. A few days later, I went to New Haven where I killed another boy. I committed a little more sodomy on him also, and then tied his belt around his neck and strangled him. Men made me what I am today. He was a cold-blooded killer who did not care who he hurt, and he was killing people who did not hurt him. We can either accept it at face value and say, this is the story, of one of the most ferocious serial killers America has ever seen before, or we can say it's just the, the empty boasts 
of a braggart. We do get a lot of false confessors among serial killers. In those days, 21 was an impressive figure, and so I think we can still say there's some possibility he exaggerated his numbers. I don't know that he did, but I suspect he did, given all the other patterns of his behavior, which were to make him look like the big, bad, tough guy. The only thing that I am aware of that Panzerim was not 100% accurate on was when he would talk about burning a flax mill down in the Oregon State Prison in Salem. He would say, and that was another $100,000 to my credit. When they did research on it, they found out it was only about $25,000 instead of 100. He claims that a photograph was taken of him while he was in Africa, and he was working with the, uh, the local native population. He claimed that this photograph appeared in an edition of the Saturday Evening Post, although it's very difficult to say that it's him. The photograph is there of a white man driving a group of natives. I haven't been able to disprove anything uh, that he said. One night while he's in the village of Larchmont, he breaks into the local train station. A local police officer sees Panzram, who is armed with an axe. The officer manages to knock Panzram unconscious. <laughs> he's arrested and charged with burglary. Panzram is sentenced to five years at Sing Sing Prison. decided by the prison authorities that because he's a rebellious prisoner, he can't be controlled, that he should be sent to another uh, prison called uh, Clinton Prison, which is in upstate New York. There were many, many punishments that were used against the convicts at Dannemora. Being put out in the open and, and, and covered with, uh, with water, left to freeze. Dannemora, as it, as it was known, named after the village that it was in, was one of the most repressive penal institutions in America. It's a prison that is encircled by a wall, 30-foot high wall, that also extends 30 feet below the ground so that nobody can tunnel under the wall. It was thought of as the hellhole, the last stop for the prisoners in the state of New York. It's in a very remote place. It's hundreds and hundreds of miles from the nearest population center. It was made for the, the most incorrigible of the incorrigible. I was there only a few months when I made a time bomb and tried to burn down the shops. The screws found it, but didn't blame me for it. After about six months of this, I was feeling pretty hot, mad, and disgusted. I attempted to escape. He almost gets to the top of a 30-foot wall. Officers there still talk with reverence about what Carl Panzram attempted to do. He made a ladder out of fencing material, and the ladder broke under his weight. I fell about 30 feet onto a concrete walk, breaking both of my ankles, both of my legs, fracturing my spine and rupturing myself. In this condition, I was carried to the prison hospital where I lay five days and dumped into a cell without any medical or surgical attention, whatever. That's going to be a message to others. Don't try this. This is what you'll get. My broken.
milk and bones were not set. My ankles and legs were not put into a cast. In that condition, I was left for eight months. Crawling around like a snake with a broken back, seething with hatred and a lust for revenge. There were many people who did die in the prison. They should have, for humanitarian reasons, certainly had him treated right away. The last two years and four months confined in isolation with nothing to do except brood upon what I thought was the wrongs that had been done to me. This went on for all of my five years. And the more they misused me, the more I was filled with the spirit of hatred and vengeance. I was so full of hate that there was no room in me for such feelings as love, pity, kindness, or honor or decency. I hated everybody I saw. <laughs> He's unable to walk, his spinal injury gets worse, and he, as a result, he remains permanently crippled for the rest of his life. Panzeran becomes even more embittered, if that's possible. I used to spend all of my time figuring out how I could murder the most people with the least harm or expense to myself. I'm writing it down with the fervent wish that someone may see it and make good use of it to decimate some of the excess population of this world. It was my intention to go to a place I had picked out at a railroad tunnel. I intended to have a large contact bomb in the middle of the tunnel fixed so that when the engine struck the obstruction, the bomb would explode. The explosion would set off and burst some large glass containers of formaldehyde and other gas. The gas fumes thus generated and let loose in the closed tunnel would in a very few minutes kill every living thing on the whole train in the tunnel. I would be stationed at the rear entrance to the tunnel behind a barricade and armed, ready to shoot down anyone who had life enough left to try to get out of the tunnel. <laughs> as soon as I was assured that all were dead, I would put on a gas mask, then enter the cars and rob the whole train. With unlimited funds in my hands, I then intended to steal millions of dollars and kill millions of people. This I intended to do by starting a war between England and the USA. Sounds fantastic, all right, but I am positive that I could and would have done it. I could do a better job than the Borgias done. They were pikers. They didn't kill half enough. They should have killed everybody and left this world for the only good things in it. Nature. This would be a damn fine world if man was out of it. Even to the point of planning um, the destruction, you know, of the entire human race. Not unlike people that were working in ammunitions or some kind of war effort to manufacture more successful weapons at destroying the most amount of people with the least amount of cost. But they're getting paid and they're getting rewarded. Oh yeah, you're doing a great service to your country. <laughs> War, in the final analysis, is merely murder and robbery at the expenditure of life and property. The psychology of a mass murderer, somebody wants to have one big event to take out as many people as they can, has to do with a, a measure of their own pain and they want as many people to pay for it as possible. Everyone now knows, I was in pain and you did nothing. During the summer of 1928, he's finally released from Bannamore. I had a goal in view and was working toward it as quickly as I could. Panzeran eventually makes his way into Philadelphia where he meets a paper boy, a 12-year-old boy. Panzeran sexually assaults this child and murders him. They're the murder of Alexander Uzak. We were able to confirm that murder through an arrest warrant that was issued by the city of Philadelphia. My whole mind was bent on figuring out different ways to annoy and punish my enemies. And everybody was my enemy. My intentions was to rob, rape, and kill everybody I could. Anybody, and everybody. After Panzram leaves Philadelphia, he goes into the city of Baltimore where he commits a number of burglaries and assaults. He leaves Baltimore and makes his way down to Washington, D.C., where he gets arrested for the last two years. He assumed that he was made this way, but not altogether. I, I think Panzram 
um, is trying to probe his own responsibility. And he says he doesn't have a conscience, so the 21 people he murdered um, doesn't, doesn't bother him. But um, if you read the other letters, uh, one wonders if, if he, he felt that entirely. All of my life I've been trying to figure out just what ails me and why. I'm not looking for the remedy or the effect. It's too late for the remedy, and I already know the effect. The only way I want to be cured is to die and get completely out of this world. All I want is to find out the reason why I am what I am, and why I act the way I do. I've been puzzled all my life about this. Would sure like to know the answer before I leave this world. I went to examine the laws on the cell. And I was pretty sure he wouldn't do anything to me. So uh, he jumped up, see, after a good close to the bars. <laughs> I thought you were trying to get me to look the other way so you could hit me. You're brave. But don't ever do that again. Turning your back on me like that. You're the only man in the world I don't want to kill. But I'm so erratic, I'm liable to do anything. Panzerin receives a sentence of 25 years to life at the uh, Leavenworth Prison back in Kansas. 25 years is an outrageous sentence for stealing a radio and some very inexpensive items. I'm doomed to pass out of the picture pretty soon. I've fully decided that I want to die. There'll be no turning aside. In some way, I shall surely accomplish my desire to die. Panzram entered the U.S. Penitentiary in Leavenworth. His name was spelled P-A-N-Z-R-A-N instead of M. The head clerk working for the records clerk was a man by the name of George Kelly Barnes, who history would know as Machine Gun Kelly. It's probably just a, a, a written error or a typographical error. Hans Ram pretty much basically wanted to set the ground rules when he first got to Leavenworth. I warned them all to lay off me and leave me alone. I told everyone that I came in contact with that I would sure knock off the first guy who bothered me. He's assigned to the uh, laundry room, and while he's in the laundry room, he meets a, a civilian employee by the name of Warnke who is the supervisor of the day shift where uh, Panzeram works. Leavenworth was under the administration of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And there was an effort to try to create a model prison. Prisoners were allowed to write to other people, receive correspondence. Henry Lesser maintains his correspondence with Carl Panzram under a pseudonym, Henry James, because they knew that the staff in Leavenworth would be monitoring Panzram's correspondence. April 23rd, 1929. Your letter of April 18th reached me today. I found the one dollar enclosed, or at any rate, I got it to my credit here on the books. Many thanks for both. I have only had your letter about an hour, and I've read it three times already, and liked it better each time. 
You ask me what sort of work I'm doing. Well, to tell the truth, I have an easy job. Not very much to do, and that little easy. I don't mind it much, but I am trying to get a different job where I'll be more by myself. Perhaps later on I'll manage it. Carl Panzram, number 31614, box 7, Leavenworth, Kansas. Wharton's book, The House of Whispering Hate, is almost one of the most non-biased books I've ever read. Charles Wharton was sentenced to the institution for conspiracy to commit mail train robbery. Warnke, civilian foreman of the laundry, whom the convicts regarded as a brute and a bully, delighting to torment his prison slaves. It was his favorite diversion to taunt Panzram about his reported moral habits. Panzram had conflicts with him. He asked for a job change, and the, the Bureau of Prisons would not honor that. They did not want Warnke to lose face with the other prisoners. I have worked with Panzram in the laundry since February 1st this year. Panzram and Mr. Warnke had a few words over three handkerchiefs which Panzram had and was washing in the bleacher in the laundry. Warnke told him that he was not permitted to use that bleacher, that he was not any better than any of the rest of us, and that no one was allowed to use that bleacher. Panzram remarked that if Warnke did not lay off him, he would get Warnke. He remained working in the laundry. June 15th, 1929. I'm still on my same job and like it less each day. I'm getting all set for a change. It won't be long now. Panzerim gets a steel bar that was in the laundry room, sneaks up behind Warnke and smashes the bar over the back of the man's head. Here's another one for you, you son of a bitch! And beats him down to the ground. He kills him in front of a dozen other inmates. Panzerim then turns his rage on the other inmates and begins an all-out brawl. Panzerim made his way back to the deputy warden's office where Phil Holtgrave was standing. And just as soon as he got up to Phil Holtgrave, he dropped the iron bar and said, do with me what you want to do because I can't get any more of them. Before I have finished, I kill one man and try to kill a dozen more. Building 63, which back then was known as the Deputy Warden's Office, the segregation building, is immediately where Panzram was taken. October 31st, 1929. I thought I would write you a letter today because I feel pretty good just now. In fact, I feel pretty near human. For several different reasons, here are a few. It's so long since I've been beaten or kicked around, chained up or knocked down that I have almost forgotten how it feels, but not quite. I still remember. Another reason is that I have just finished my supper and man, what a feed. I started with bacon and eggs. Candied sweet potatoes, bread and butter, stewed prunes, and four fresh pears. That's a sample of the meals we gather every day lately. After I finished throwing this feed into myself, I sat down to smoke and read the daily paper. In peace, quiet, and comfort. Now perhaps you will know why this letter is a bit different from some of the others I've written to you. I walk into a cell fully expecting to be chained up and beaten to death. But what happens? The exact reverse of that. No one lays a hand on me. No one abuses me in any way. I have been in the past three or four months trying to figure it out, and I have come to the conclusions that if in the beginning I had been treated as I am now, then there wouldn't have been quite so many people in this world that have been robbed, raped, and killed. And perhaps also, very probably, I wouldn't be where I am today. Maybe I am wrong, though. I am too dumb to know what might have been, but I am not so dumb that I can't see a little way into the future. Not very far, but far enough to see the end of Carl Panzram. Compared to some other institutions that he had been in, it was a relatively progressive regime. 
at that point in time, you had Robert Stroud, who was occupying two cells in the cell house. Robert Stroud uh, today is is very famous uh, as the Birdman of Alcatraz. Even though he, he kept his birds at Leavenworth, and he kept them when he was there with Pan's room. During his long imprisonment, Robert Stroud secretly wrote a book about the history of American prisons and the history of the federal prison system. Stroud wrote, looking outward, a history of the United States prison system at Alcatraz Penitentiary, where he was, uh, had been transferred from Leavenworth Penitentiary. But Stroud had written this manuscript However, it was said that it had been confiscated by the federal prison authorities and destroyed. The director of the Bureau of Prisons said, no, you can't publish these. These glorify crime. These contain pornography. These tell lies about prison officials. However, it was later revealed that a copy of it had actually been preserved. I got those four handwritten manuscripts, still have them. Stroud was in cell number 10. In that, manuscript, he devoted uh, a chapter to Pan's room. Pan's room was across the hallway in cell 13, so they were within earshot of each other. Segments of it have been obtained and consulted for use in this film. And in this box is part three of Stroud's History of the United States Prison System. Here's chapter 19 of part three on Carl Panzram and Stroud's own handwriting. Panzram was put in number 13. He told of sea murders by the score. He varied the number of victims from one to 48. He told of boxcar murders by the hundreds, of boys he had met on the road, induced to catch trains with him, raped, strangled, and thrown out along the right of way. It was obvious to anyone listening who knew anything about such things that the stories were pure fiction. There is quite a lot of similarity between Carl Panzerum and Robert Stroud. They managed somehow, after many, many years of, of deprivation, they somehow managed to leave something behind. Because Warnke was murdered inside a federal prison, the Federal Bureau of Investigation had jurisdictional authority on conducting the investigation. And they determined that Carl Panzram was writing to Henry James, who they verified as being Henry Lesser. Lesser was never chastised for his correspondence with Carl Panzram because he explained that he was writing to Panzram for criminology purposes. He's eventually brought to trial, and he is convicted of murder in the first degree. After his death sentence, while he's waiting in cell for the execution date, a local uh, anti-death penalty group uh, tried to intervene on, on his behalf. And without Panzram's cooperation or approval, uh, Panzram contacted the group and said, look, don't help me. I choose to die here and now by being hanged by the neck until I am dead. I look forward to that as a real pleasure and a big relief to me. He wanted to die because he didn't want to stay in prison all his life. I prefer death before spending more years in prison. My belief is that life without liberty is not worth having. If you let him out, he didn't want to die. If you're going to keep him in prison, he wants to die. The only thanks you or your kind will ever get from me for your efforts in my behalf is that I wish you all had one neck and that I had my hands on it. June 5th, 1930. There is nothing I can do for you to repay you for the many favors you have done for me. For the vast majority that can be reached, you need to hire people like Henry Lesser, but you have to have a system that rewards that kind of person, and they don't. Henry Lesser, with very little training, knew to treat these people as human beings. I would like to be able to truthfully tell you that I do thank you, but this I cannot do simply because there is no such thing as gratitude left in me. There was at one time, but that time is long gone. Gratitude is one of the many things that have been kicked out of me. I can and do truthfully wish you good luck.
In the isolation building, there's a doorway out the back. The back has a courtyard that was used for recreational purposes back then, and they constructed the gallows in that courtyard. Up to that point, the U.S. government hadn't really held an organized execution. This was a method of, of execution that was very much associated uh, in the public mind with lynching. More people were lynched every year than were executed by the government. People of Kansas, as a result of various populist movements that, that went on beginning in the mid-19th century, elected not to carry out executions. This was effectively broken with the execution of Pansrum. It's a vengeance. We want our pound of flesh. Pans Ram sees two ministers standing there, immediately starts hissing and demanding that they be told to leave. I don't mind being hanged, but I don't want any preachers at my hanging. Like he did a lot of other times in his life, he, he took on a mood of bravado. If you don't run those Bible backs out, you're gonna have one hell of a time getting me out of this cell. And you're gonna have to fight every step of the way. I can't win, but I have nothing to lose either. Every man I get one of my hands on is going to a hospital. All right, let's get going. What in hell are we stalling around for? Said Panzram, leading the procession down the hall, almost dragging his longer-legged attendants along like a bull on a leash. In the house whispering hate, I read this other prisoner's account, which proves the fact that it did happen the way he described. The people that were in authority in the prison would had blocked off like all the windows so that the prisoners could not witness the execution. But, uh, as he says here, but they forgot one window. It did not look directly down in the yard, yet it permitted a slanting view. Through it, we could see the gallows and the commencement of the ghastly death march that very last window in the parole dorm, which was what we called a dormitory when I first started to work there. That window was in perfect alignment with the courtyard where Panzeram was executed. He perfectly describes the fact that all of the inmates were all jammed in that window watching. So probably it is an accurate account of what occurred at that execution. When he came out the back door talking about Panzeram, we saw him, 200 pounds of flesh possessed of but one virtue, brute courage. He was less to be pitied than the ashen-faced officials shrinking from the task they had in hand. There was no faltering in his step as he marched out of the door into the open courtyard. Then suddenly he, he bellowed, boo, and whipped around to enjoy the fear he inspired. A frightful grin spreading over his face as everyone startled in alarm at the sound. <laughs> Apparently this was not enough to satisfy the brute in him, for as he passed out of sight, I saw him wheel around again and spit full in the face of the captain of the guard, which is what he always promised to do. So he actually did it. He actually led the guards to go up the scaffold steps. He was first. Hurry it up, you. Hurry up, you bastard. I could kill 10 men while you're fooling around. Yeah, you who's your bastard. I can hang a dozen men while you're fooling around. Whether he said anything to the executioner is still up in the air. Hurry it up, you who's your bastard. I can hang a dozen men while you're fooling around. It was all over in a matter of seconds. A lot of those grave markers in that cemetery are pretty much basically nothing more than a cement post that sticks approximately, I'd say probably six, eight inches above the ground. The inmates' names were generally stamped in a uh, copper plate or a brass plate. It was his last name and his inmate reg number. Their name tags disappear all the time. At Panzeram's gravesite, there's actually just 
the stone post is sticking up above the ground. His grave is unmarked. We have a portion of the rope from the noose that was used to hang Carl Panzeran. We also have the blindfold cloth that actually went over his eyes and the weighted black hood that was placed over Panzeran's head uh, before the noose was put around his neck. I don't want any Bible-backed hypocrites at my funeral. Run them out and I will go out under my own power. I don't want to cause any trouble, for I'm as anxious to get it over with as you are. We also have a leather and chain harness uh, here. It's on a metal frame for display, but uh, this leather and chain harness was uh, placed on Panzram. was used six different times in the Kansas City area. Merle Gill was a ballistics expert in the Kansas City area in the 1920s. He sold the noose, the hood, and the eye band to the United States Marshals. He, we actually have invoices for those items. At some point later on, we don't know exactly when, uh, they came back into Gill's collection. Merle Gill had been collecting firearms, and he turned that collection into a kind of a traveling museum. By 1948, he was broke. He sold his collection to Mr. Davis, and uh, Mr. Davis put it all on display. Henry Lesser used to carry those documents out of the Washington, D.C. jail every night under his coat. He spent 40 years trying to get that manuscript published. It's an amazing story. He treated, you know, the Panzram's writings, you know, you know, like they were the Magna Carta. Without Henry Lesser, that you'd never know anything about Carl Panzram. It was Gitchoff that brought Henry Lesser to San Diego State to speak uh, at Scripps Cottage about uh, prison reform. Just to have him come down and speak to the class. In 1979, he came down. He was very well received. If Mother Teresa had come in and was talking to, to the group or Gandhi or something, I mean, he, he inspired uh, that kind of awe when they found out, wow, you, this little guy, you're dealing with this monster. One of my graduate students was just really enthralled with, with Henry Lesser as well. His name was Joel Goodman. While he was at San Diego State, we recorded an interview with him. Did he ever express any fear about going to Leavenworth? Oh, no. No, because he's been quite a few maximum security prisons. The following year, in 1980, he decided to donate the original Panzram manuscript to the Special Collections Department of the Library at San Diego State University. Did he express other emotions? Did he, did he love anyone else? Could he get along with anyone else? I never said anything about his papers or him donating them or anything like that. It didn't even dawn on him, it didn't occur to me. And somewhere along the line, he made the offer, would, would you like the Panzeran papers, and I said, "Well, sure. Well, why not?" You know, I, I wasn't that enthused about it. Okay, I guess, I guess so. And and then I didn't realize uh, just how big a thing this, this really was. And I m notified uh, the library, so yeah, we'd be happy to get them. I want to thank you very much for traveling down from Los Angeles yeah, and uh, spending pleasure. your day with us here. Pleasure. Right and uh, I want to thank all of you for inviting me down here. It's a great day. <laughs> and, and especially from the, from the students, because it was, That's right. it was, <laughs> it was their uh, emphasis and yeah. their pursuing this that got Wonderful. you here. It's encouraging to see young people today, you know, with this interest, socially minded and acquiring minds and want, wanting to do something good about criminology. And he passed away in 1983. Lesser is uh, uh, a heroic sort. I wanted to read this uh, a portion from uh, the papers, the Panzram papers, that deal with uh, uh, Panzram's view of of, uh, of the crime problem and, and where it begins and how to prevent it. It says, every child has some criminal tendencies. It is your place to correct those traits and teach them the right way to live while they are young and their minds are farming. 
Then when they do reach the age of reason and action, action, it will be quite quite natural for them to live clean, upright, honorable lives. In that way, you will stop crime at its source before it begins. The main causes of why we are what we are is because of our improper teaching, lack of knowledge, and our environments. Teach them the meaning of such things as truth, lie, honor, hate, love. For each lesson, just take one word. For instance, take the word truth. Teach them by example, word, and deed until they thoroughly know that one word, truth. He said it all. And he wasn't a pediatrician or a sociologist or a psychiatrist. But he sure knew what he's talking about. If you are really sincere in wanting to teach those boys how to grow up to be good men, then you will have to go at it far differently than the way I was taught. It's timeless because here's a man who, who has tried to tell us what's wrong and what we need to do, and a man who has no education but had the foresight, insight, to see it, to live through it, and basically you know, gave his life for it. Apparently, Carl Panzram had a last will and testament, but it has not been located. In the case file, there's a letter from a Dr. C.B. Van Horn, who was the attending physician at the Kansas Industrial School for Boys. And in the letter he writes, I have a photostat copy of his last will and testament in which he bequeaths his carcass to the city dog catcher of East Grand Forks, Minnesota to be used as dog meat. He terminates by leaving a curse to all mankind. I think Panzram himself was telling us that he should be a warning. He's just trying to let you know, look what you did to me. If you keep it up, you're going to get me a hundredfold, a millionfold, a trillionfold. So beware. Either listen to me or, or die. I'm sorry for only two things. These two things are... I am sorry that I have mistreated some few animals in my lifetime. And I am sorry that I am unable to murder the whole damn human race. All that I leave behind me is smoke, death, desolation, and damnation. Carl Pantram. Let's just born bad, the bad come to me, it's bad the only thing I learned after a life of misery, all the building up the gallows outside my prison cell, did they tie the noose to hang me, and send me back to hell, I was just 13, my first time out on parole, I jumped up on a boxcar and became a Started in stealing and burglary at will. Prison taught me how to hate, how to lie, and how to kill. I was just born bad, as bad as I could be. Take a life, gotta give your life, is what they said to me. After I raped the crew, I shot them all right through the throat. Way down in West Africa, put out from the docks. I had my way with all the men, then I fed them to the crops. I was just born bad, as bad as I could be. Take a life, gotta give your life. It's what they said to me. Stuck me in this prison First thing that I did Was wait for someone to bother me And I killed the first one that did Now the building up the scaffold Lay me in the ground But I could have hung a dozen men In the time they fooled around I was just born bad As bad as I could be Take a life, gotta give you life what they said to me I was just born bad as bad as I could be take a life gotta give your life 